cord here. It's on. It's on. Beautiful. Okay. So welcome, folks, to uh, today's Hyperledger Supply Chain Special Interest Group. Thursday, what are we, November 12th here. And today we have Ravi Yaganathan from Crips to share with us a story that uh, they've built and they've worked on. And one of the things that Mark and I have been talking about and a lot of you have uh, chatted about is that ROI. Where, where can we get story, where can we hear more stories that have ROI? So Ravi's going to take us through some of their stories, some of the work they've done. Uh, and he can answer questions both from a business perspective as well as a technical perspective as we, we go through this. So thanks for joining. And Ravi, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, Tom. Thanks for uh, the nice introduction. And, uh, uh, you know, nice to see a very uh, powerful team here. <laughs> and uh, just uh, without wasting much of my time, I'm just getting uh, into the presentation. The presentation format is uh, in three parts. Uh, the part one is a little bit of introduction about us and then uh, going deeper into the supply chain projects that we have done. And then later I will uh, give some time for uh, addressing the questions if anybody has anything. So quickly, Cripsy, we are a, you know, a five-year-old uh, blockchain technology company. We are just sitting on top of Hyperledger. And uh, what we do is we have uh, our own uh, solution called Cripcore. Cripcore is an end-to-end uh, blockchain as a service, full lifecycle management uh, technology platform. It's a low code and a domain agnostic and cloud agnostic. So Cripcore almost reduces 90% of programming efforts. That means uh, a very deep cost saving that allows uh, the new startups and also corporates to make sure that the hyperledger solutions are uh, really uh, cost effective and giving them adequate commercial benefit because uh, if we don't uh, uh, you know, plan our cost well, the return on investment of any hyperledger solution could be highly questionable. And in our experience, uh, lots of projects in the initial stages, they found that it's very cost, uh, uh, you know, uh, highly, uh, uh, you know, the, the asset heavy model. So it's not producing enough uh, returns for them. So we decided that we should focus and then build a technology platform that helps organizations and commercial enterprises to build hyperledger solutions at a fraction of cost and also quickly, that's more important. And it is, uh, they are able to scale as the ecosystem uh, grows. So that's what uh, Cripcore is about. So- okay. Can I ask a quick question about that to Cripcore? Or maybe you're gonna talk more, you're gonna talk more about it. what, what uh, um, fabric or, or what, what Hyperledger projects does it deploy to? Is it fabric, is it sawtooth? It's, it's fabric. We, we work only on fabric okay. right now, but it can be deployed on other uh, flavors of Hyperledger, but we are just uh, doing research on a couple of other Hyperledger uh, flavors. Right now it is Hyperledger fabric, you're right. Okay, good, thank so you. So you can, you can build, deploy, manage and scale. It's a low code, so it's not going to take a lot of time or programming efforts. So if you, if you have an idea, then you'll be able to quickly have a solution and then probably it's not only quickly having a solution, you will be iteratively move up to the production without making much of uh, programming efforts. That's how Cripcore is built. And the pillars of Cripcore, I would say we have got four modules. Studio is a low code environment. It's a drag and drop tool where you can define what your processes, events, data, and also users. And uh, it, it's a, you know, it gives a very quickly, it gives uh, UI that you can test the solution and also it generates APIs and uh, it's, a, it's a fully automated. And then the workbench is something like uh, GUI driven. If you want to manage uh, the applications in the real time environment, the workbench helps. You don't have to you know code anything exclusively for that. And it also comes with the data lake. Data lake is something you know you don't have to directly query the 
uh, you know, the, the protocol for any of uh, the reports that you want to run. Probably the data lake takes care of that. And then the data lake also is helpful in terms of data analytics and other things that you want to run. And finally, crypto boss, you know, in any cloud, you know, it, it brings it, all the artifacts of the respective cloud so that uh, you don't have to really uh, get deeper into cloud and also it's uh, faster to deploy in any cloud. That's how it is. Right now we support uh, four different clouds, but we are also expanding our uh, cloud presence. And then the differentiator, as I was mentioning, is a cloud agnostic, codeless way, higher throughput you can see because of the data lake kind of a value add, and then economic viability because once the asset cost is uh, uh, you know reduced, then always you can see the return is uh, justified. So that's how the economic viability is assured. So that said, the core part of the presentation is about supply chain use cases. We have done close to about eight use cases, but only two of them are in production and uh, others are still in either pilot or POC, uh, but it's, it, it will mature at some point in time. And uh, some of the projects, uh, we have got some NDA, probably we may not be able to talk in this forum, but as we mature, we can bring the, our clients to this forum and they can talk about it at appropriate time. So the first project is about the chocolate supply chain. It's uh, connecting the, co the chocolate cocoa growers in Equator to the brands, chocolate brands in Europe and the retail chains in Europe and also connecting to the consumer that's uh, chocolate lovers in Europe. So all these participants, even including in between the processors and logistic companies, everybody is connected in this uh, uh, program. And uh, what happens, this program, you know, every now and then we, we keep uh, hearing questions like, okay, why are we doing it? And is it, uh, you know, really producing any economic uh, uh, value or uh, commercial benefit for any of the participants? That's a question we keep uh, hearing. Here it is very clearly, uh, you know, uh, uh, demonstrated because uh, I don't have the video to show today because it's uh, 20 minutes, so I couldn't take the uh, opportunity of showing the video, but we have got a com complete program in, in video. So what happens that the chocolate bar has got a QR code. Once you open the, the outer layer, inside layer has got a QR code. If you scan the QR code, it connects to the, the program and you can put your credentials, your email ID, and then you're registered and immediately you can get to see what is the complete, the trace and track of the chocolate bar. You know, it is not just a, you know, the, the static, it's dynamic. So for every chocolate, uh, for that batch, it gives, okay, who's the farmer who grew that uh, cocoa uh, plant and uh, the, the entire chain. So you'll be able to see through the entire chain in a lovely UI. And not only that, it gives you the benefit of the loyalty because what they have done is the marketing budget, they've just converted that into this loyalty program in this blockchain trains and you know, the, uh, this program. So now you can claim your loyalty and also you can donate a tree. You can plant a tree for a farmer whom you are seeing in that, uh, you know, when you, when you scan the QR code, you are seeing the farmer and his family, and his needs and values in the world, everything. Now you, as a gratuity, probably you can give him back some of the points. So assuming that you get three points for every chocolate that you are going to, uh, you know, buy and eat when you scan when you scan the QR code. Now you have the ability to probably okay. I don't want these three, uh, you know, points. Instead, I will give donate this to that farmer. He can benefit because I like this chocolate. And not only that, it. It shows all the important, you know, certificates that this entire manufacturing process that went through. It could be, you know, your food certificate, food related certificate, quality related certificate, organic related certificate. All these certificates are also part and parcel of this program. So now, in a very, you know, simple way, when you click, click the QR, you have the ability to see the entire chain. So. 
Now, the brands take this as an opportunity to promote their brand because when they when they give this kind of a transparent communication to the consumer, they believe that the consumer is willing to pay a little bit a premium price and also they can retain that consumer. So that's a very, very effective. One of the universities in, uh, in uh, UK, they are they have completed that research, but they have not published yet. But since we are part of the program, we have got some kind of a understanding how economically the brand is getting benefited because of this program. And uh, without going deeper into the data, I will be able to show some of the benefits in the following screens. But I would say these are all common benefits in any supply chain that we can think of. And uh, before I go to that slide, I will talk about another project, which is again, uh, uh, you know, agricultural commodity supply chain in, uh, in Dubai, it's called you know DMCC. It's a, a you know commodity exchange in Dubai, and they procure uh, the agricultural produces for the exchange from India. So there is a whole lot of you know it's it's a it's a vast uh, uh, country, uh, and uh, you know they source uh, produces across uh, India, but at the same time they want to make sure for better transparency and also trust because. If you are if you are going to put some dollars in, uh, in in trade commodity trading, you should be assured that there is a really underlying commodity available somewhere. So they want to bring uh, that trust layer, and they wanted to capture the entire supply chain right from uh, the the farmer or agricultural farm level, and uh, until it goes to the the warehouse. And in warehouse also, they they maintain the entire inventory and through API is connected. Now the exchange has got a complete visibility to the, the, the underlying asset that is uh, you know, available right from the form until it is coming to the uh, warehouse. And also whenever there is a asset going down, the, the, the inventory going down, so accordingly the value of the exchange, you know, the, the corpus of the exchange should come down. So all these integrities are uh, address and this is purely you know it, it is a trust based system and uh, the lack of such trust they used to have some uh, uh, very uh, 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 you know laborious uh, complicated system in place where people used to go from place to place and then keep doing some verifications and audits and uh, give some certificates and there are time delays there are reconciliations and whole lot of challenge because of uh, you know, it's it's not every day they have to go through this process. It's not like once in a month I'm going to do. And this becomes very complicated. And assurance of that certificate, whoever is giving that certificate, is sometimes is questionable. So that's why they they believe that this kind of a, a trust based system is essential. And then on top of that, they would like they they wanted to build multiple uh, business models, multiple D apps, all those things they want to build. So this is the second. Uh, uh, system that we put in production and just to give you the glimpse of you know for example this is the UAE India introduces blockchain platform for traceable trade in this if you go to the last uh, uh, paragraph where backed by Dubai multi-commodity center that's where the blockchain component is used and we uh, uh, develop that blockchain component along with our partners and we deliver that for achieving this uh, uh, you know, trust-based uh, marketplace and also trust-based uh, exchange. That's what we have done. The next one is I was referring to the, the chocolate uh, uh, connecting consumers with uh, the, the farmers. This is again, uh, you know, it's in production and uh, it's going very good. In fact, uh, brands are demanding much better price and also uh, the, the, the brand uh, uh, equity is going up because of such programs. These these two projects that we have done. And when it comes to question of value drivers, I would go from uh, on the right hand side top. You know, uh, from one o'clock, I will go. It's cost. You know, definitely it's it, it's it's bringing down the inefficiency in the system, both in, in terms of time and cost because of certain intermediary processes. Because people are you know, for example, if a logistic fellow or, a, a, you know, if he has to 
give some information. It takes a lot of time for that information to come into the system. Here, directly he's feeding that information, so there is no delay. It's just an example. So there's definitely the cost is a, a primary, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of attraction at this point in time for anybody who is looking at supply chain uh, uh, program to be deployed in blockchain. And the second one is the social purpose because of, you know, everybody is keen nowadays to demonstrate and encourage the sustainable behavior because this is uh, one of the ways they can clearly demonstrate to the stakeholders and also to their customers and to the society, which will take them ahead of the competition. That's what they believe. And of course, compliance and governance, as I was mentioning, if you are talking about we are using organic, uh, uh, you know, the producers, then definitely we need to see some compliance and governance coming in our way because the governments are more keen, like, you know, the food regulations and a lot of stuff they, 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 they need to maintain. So they, the corporates believe that it is easy, there's no additional cost, and that they can substantially uh, demonstrate their compliance and their governance. And then, of course... Ravi, can I ask a question there? You talked about certificates earlier. How, how are you providing the certificates or providing the, uh, I guess, certification is probably a better word that things are actually happening in the real world and translating into the, the digital world? Yeah, we, we provide... Uh, you and maybe, know, and maybe let's talk about the, the chocolate bars and the chocolate from Ecuador to Europe. But this, the other bar is the name of the is the name of the chocolate. That's right. Okay, so let's talk, let's talk about that one. How how's that one? In the other bar, we are not having any organic uh, certificates in place. But in the commodity exchange, there are certificates. For example, if somebody is saying that I have this uh, this produce and I'm going to have some uh, uh, you know ten thousand pounds of uh, that produce in my warehouse. And there is a certificate with respect to multiple things. Whether that warehouse is a, what kind of a grade that warehouse is, is it a fire, uh, a, a, you know, proof? And there are multiple certificates that they will be uh, uh, requiring or they have to prove. So they right now there are two ways that they do it. You know, through oracles, uh, we can we can you know they can upload the certificates which are in the paper form because in India, as you know. The, not all the certificates are in digital form. So we need to make sure that they, it's a, the, the paper form is uh, available. And some certification where through API, the certifying authorities are willing to connect. They can connect, for example, the APEDA, the Agriculture Produce uh, Export uh, 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 Department in India. They have a fully digital system. So they can give an API and through API, whenever they are giving a certificate, they can also put a digital certificate into the, uh, uh, into the blockchain network. So this will eventually, that's what will happen. The, the paper-based certification will disappear and then the, the entire system will be, the digital certificate will be uh, uh, available in the system itself. So that gives a complete provenance for the certificate because it's, it has got a timestamp, it has got a location stamp, and it has got a digital signature certificate of issuing authority. So it gives a complete immutability and also the, uh, the, the trustworthy uh, certificate uh, is available in the system. So that's how we have uh, we, 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 are, we, are, we are considered in the system. Now, coming to the new business models, for example, I'm giving back uh, some donations to the farmer and uh, same way I can you know, create a loyalty program, which is, a, uh, which is a not a conventional loyalty program. So these are all the new business models that uh, uh, you know, the brands are trying to adopt. And there could be multiple business models they can think of. And just these value drivers is generally for any blockchain solution I'm talking about. And uh, brand equity and revenue is again, you know, if you are able to substantiate that, you know, the provenance of your product, then maybe you can avoid some duplication or, uh, you know, uh, somebody climbing that oh, I'm also having the same chocolate and give, making some, you know, uh, uh, small changes in the name. Uh, people can sell a chocolate, but here completely the consumer will know that this is the brand and, and the store when I'm sit standing there, it gives the complete 
uh, uh, trace and track and up till the store. So I know that I am buying that brand which I can trust. This is a complete provenance that uh, coming in. So these aspects are going to give some revenue benefit. I'll, I'll talk about the specific uh, the project, what the first project, what I have, we have done. These are all the value drivers directly that we have seen because it's giving the sustainability information for informed buying because I know I'm buying this chocolate which is sourced from so and so, so and so place. And I know that it traveled through this, uh, you know, logistic system and the processing happened in one, two, three points. And finally, it, uh, it arrived at, uh, say, Albert Hain in Netherlands. Now I'm standing in that store, I'm buying and then hanging. So I'm taking a well informed decision. So before buying or at the time of buying, it's not like only I know the brand and I'm buying it. So everything that I'm buying, giving me that well informed decision, that means uh, the, the, the new customers, you know, uh, will, will be able to, you know, onboarding a new customer is easy because uh, if, for example, a new product somebody is launching, if it is a new brand, so, you know, for example, uh, there are a lot of uh, new generation food items. It's like uh, the like meatless uh, uh, burger. You know, it's really not a meat, but it, it's a vegan. But now how I believe that it is uh, meatless. So there, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, approach will help for them to onboard new customer. And then that will increase the revenue. The next one is a loyalty token. Because uh, I, I don't... Uh, Ravi, quick quick question on the revenue side. Do either one of these use cases have revenue figures or is it more kind of a, uh, this is anticipated? No, no, they have revenue figures. In fact, I was uh, mentioning about one of the universities in the uh, uh, UK. They have done a study and just they are about to publish, probably in a week or 10 days they'll be publishing. Maybe I will share that report with, uh, with you. You will have a clear understanding of what is the price benefit they are looking at? Okay, good, good. And then I can put it in the uh, wiki mm -hmm. together with the recording here so that people have access to it. That'd be great. Absolutely. And the next one is, uh, you know, it's, it's customer retention because uh, uh, when I get the royalty talk, because nowadays look at a chocolate, at chocolate bar level, or if you are drinking uh, some beverage, you know, at that beverage level, giving the loyalty is very, 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 uh, impracticable. It's it's not. We have not seen that kind of a loyalty at all. You can get loyalty when you go to the Hilton's, or you can get loyalty when you fly in Emirates. You can get loyalty when you buy Louis Vuitton. All those things are possible, but not at the FMCG level. It's very very difficult. And here at every product, a customer just punch in their email, and then they get the loyalty because they become part of the system. So when they enjoy that part of the system and get the loyalty. When I am consuming something, that gives me the, you know, it's, it's, it, it helps to optimize the average realization per customer. I don't mind paying, you know, my, once I be customer, probably continuously I buy that item and that optimizes my average realization per customer because as you know, the customer acquisition cost at that kind of a market is extremely high because I need to do some kind of a promotions in the TV, in the multiple media. So that cost I need to recover. So the average realization is the only way that I can recover my cost of acquiring a customer. Here it is possible because the loyalty tokens was not possible in the past. And then comes the, the transparent uh, sharing of my entire data. You know, probably I can, I can say that none of my factory employees are, you know, people below, say, 15 years. So none of my, all the, the, the factories are fully of high quality and good standards. So those kind of information, when I put it in the, in the system, then it enhances my brand equity, both from the stakeholder perspective and also from the market perspective, that's what it is. So yeah. this is, uh, you know, this, this kind of information, probably not in these two projects we have done, but we have done another project, which is kind of, a, you know, tracing and tracking of a pit waste, pit bottle waste from the uh, corner of uh, some of the Indian rural area, and that got converted into uh, a pit yarn, and then it got uh, a polyester yarn, and it got converted into garment. Now, people in uh, uh, Switzerland, a brand called Switcher, 
they are buying that and then they are seeing the entire place in crack. Now look at that, the branch equity is going up because of this kind of a practice that is possible using blockchain. We have done that in Hyperledger as well. And the last but not least is the, the factory to store data. You know, I, through API, people can connect that store. For example, there is a Albert Einstein store I was referring to, for example, it's not a real case, but if they are putting the data into uh, through API, then if you are standing in front of the aisle in that store, then you know when you buy that, you know exactly this travel all the way to that stuff aisle, and I can reasonably assume that this is the original product. So the combating the counterfeit is possible, which will prevent the revenue leakage. Again, all of all of you know, there's a study and then there's a published report that six to seven percent of uh, any consumer product. As is a is a kind of you know uh, counterfeit. So that means uh, every brand is losing that opportunity of the revenue. Now this helps. So these are four important areas where we believe wherever we have done these uh, supply chain projects, they are able to substantiate their cost. And one side using crypto, the cost is extremely it is efficient. Probably you know it comes to a third of the cost of a ground up development. And then on the other side, if we can substantiate these four or more uh, value uh, that they're deriving from this program, then definitely the ROI is substantiated. So now what happens on, this is only the beginning, right? Now on top of this, you can build multiple apps. It could be, you know, anybody, whoever is a participant, they can build their own DIA and they can see that they can, they can bring some business models through the DR and they can benefit. Now, the, these four you know, value drivers will substantiate the, the majority of the investment and uh, any delta investment that is happening at a DR level, people can benefit or people can do it for various reasons. It need not necessarily for the commercial benefit. So this is what we have been seeing consistently in the last you know, six to uh, uh, eight quarters that companies are more interested, our uh, brands are more interested, our uh, new generation startups are more interested because of these reasons. And uh, yeah, having okay. to be actually, done... can, can, I, can I ask a question there, Ravi? So, so on the the other bar and the agriculture commodity exchange, let, let's take the let's take the commodity exchange. Um, who came to you? And who was part of the, the, the network, right? And how did they work through the challenges? Did, did, you know, did, did multiple people have to put up money in order to do it? And I know you, you can't share out everything, but you know the challenge of blockchains and getting people to agree. You know, sometimes it's, it's just one organization. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on the agricultural commodity exchange or the, uh, the other bar, the chocolate. You know, who, who drove yeah. these things and said, this is what we need and who else needed to, to inv be involved in it in order to make it real? Sure. See, you know, some programs are driven by the very uh, new generation startups. Uh, for example, the other bar, it's uh, the brand is uh, the other bar, but uh, it is run by uh, a fair chain foundation in uh, Netherlands. It's they are the anchor for bringing multiple brands. It's not only other bar. There were a uh, few coffee brands that they have brought on board like Mui Coffee and others. So they are taking that initiative to make sure that the farmers in Africa, they are not exploited by uh, some large brands. That is the fair trade that, uh, 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 you know, uh, they want to make sure that the fair trade is in place. The value distribution is demonstrated. Uh, transparently that is their objective so on top of that this kind of uh, you know the supply chain program from farmer to consumer they they wanted to bring in so that is how fat chain took a uh, anchor or a leader approach in that program when you talk about the commodity exchange commodity exchange by itself they are the ultimate biggest uh, beneficiary because they are showing the the true uh, the trustworthy asset layer in the system. They were fighting. They, they, it's, it was difficult for any exchange to show that uh, the uh, in, a, in a trusted way about the availability of underlying asset. 
So there, there are always intermediaries, but this is the, with blockchain, they were able to substantiate that. So they were able to bring in all the participants into the ecosystem. But as you very well said, it's most of the ecosystem participants may not come in on the day one. It's going to take some time, but they have brought in some critical players into the system in the first phase now. And as they move along, they are going to bring all the ecosystem players. For example, if there is some warehouse, uh, uh, you know, some of the warehouses probably may not be participating in the system because right now they may not have the technology wherewithal or anything. You know, even they may not have the commercial, uh, 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 you know, viability to be part of this system. They may not own a node and they may probably give some information. That's all. But over a period of time, there will be incentive for them to come on board. So it will happen. They have got a very clear plan in front of them. In probably in a few years from now, they will see all the ecosystem players coming on board. So right now, the key beneficiaries and uh, the, the leader, I would say, they are driving this kind of adoption with the next layer of the participants who are also benefiting. So they are bringing them into the system. So in both these cases, this is how the ecosystem is getting better. Okay. So so the so the so the the uh, bottom line is that on the in the chocolate story, it's this foundation in the Netherlands and uh, the agricultural commodity exchange is these folks DMCC and in Dubai who drove. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And and it sounds like they they picked a few key partners to work with. They didn't try to boil the ocean through there. Uh, all, all of the different potential players that are out there, they picked a few that would be important. To work yeah, with. They, they, they clearly they, they understood boiling the ocean is not possible. So they want yeah. to make sure that the ocean gets boiled <laughs> on its own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. That, that helps. Yeah. So about Cripsy, we have done multiple projects. Just it's a sample, you know, we have done close to 50 plus projects using our Cripcore. And uh, eight of them are in production. Two already I have mentioned, and uh, these are all different kind of a uh, large corporate, uh, uh, you know, goodwill that we are enjoying in the market. And thanks to most of the corporate uh, accelerated programs, all of them, you know, they considered us as one of their cohorts. And with that help, we were able to get deeper into the market. And uh, yeah, that's this is about okay. Actually, this is about Good. our project. Good. So let's see uh, if any questions are out there from uh, some of the folks that are in attendance here directly um, on this. And I guess uh, may, maybe I have a, a question for you. Um, how hard is it with the, uh, the crypt, 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 crypt core, I guess it'd be called? Is it for developers? Is it for, uh, do you have to be a developer in order to use any of the work what? Workbench or the uh, I can't remember the drag and drop kind of thing. That's more my edification. Well, it is definitely you know you not be a developer to use a crypt core because it's a drag and drop tool. But again, it depends on the complexity of the program. If you are going to have uh, too much of uh, business logics uh, and uh, uh, rules and uh, you, you know. Uh, then probably you may have to do a certain degree of scripting, but it is again not too complicated uh, programming. You know, it's just a Java scripting. And uh, remaining that, you if you want to have a, a very fancy UIs, then probably you need to have a, some kind of a external UI agencies uh, who can build UIs because our UIs are straight. You know. It, not fancy it's just a simple ui for you to test the application yeah. and run the program okay um and i guess i'll ask one one other question here we'll see what what else we have before we uh, wrap up um where was the biggest challenge with blockchain in each of these projects for 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 not so much for yourselves but for the organizations this foundation netherlands and the dmcc folks well, uh, the, 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 the foundation in Netherlands, we started in 2017 as a pilot. And at that time, uh, you know, the, the ch uh, we did not foresee certain uh, uh, complex uh, scenarios that we may have to manage in blockchain. 
uh, one is obviously uh, the uh, the GDPR because uh, we want to make sure because the brands in uh, uh, Europe they are obviously you know bound by GDPR and yep. they do not deal with uh, the personal identifiable information in chain. So we had to uh, architect the whole program to make sure some of the uh, PII information are off chain and that's number one. And number two, we, uh, we uh, you know, when we model uh, the, the architecture and the infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, based on certain business information given by them in terms of number of uh, uh, brands, number of consumers and number of, uh, you know, uh, the documents and all those stuff that may come into the system. There is an again, you know, because we do not want uh, the, the infrastructure to uh, grow, uh, uh, you know, uh, exponentially. So we, we had to do some architecture to make sure that because uh, just the blockchain, uh, putting a solution, developing a solution itself is not uh, the cost. As you know, the infrastructure is the biggest uh, challenge as, uh, as you scale up. So we were able to uh, you know, understand that very well in the beginning, and then we 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 kind of sized it very well, and also we created certain architecture. So now, even though if you load some uh, you know you know heavy data, at some point in time we will make sure that it is not hurting uh, the uh, the ecosystem participants. Okay. Other than that, we did not have any issue because see, primarily the objective of crypto is to make sure that any technology challenges are well addressed. And that's why we brought in Data Lake, for example. And also we have got our own, uh, uh, the crypto has got certain queuing mechanism to make sure that uh, uh, no transaction is uh, uh, unattended. So there are multiple, and also we have got a key vault uh, interfaces available. So all the practically, you know, if you can think of uh, any, uh, you know, challenges uh, when you run a blockchain, we addressed all those challenges in crypto. So pretty much uh, that that was helping uh, in maturing to the production. Okay, good. Let's see if there's anything out there from anybody. Brad, I saw that you had some commodity pool operator insurance. I don't, I'm not sure where that goes, but if you want to speak. Well, he already he already he already answered it. So okay. it's uh, the Netherlands, Beautiful. Netherlands and Dubai. Thank you. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. I had a question. Uh, this is uh, Salil from GS1 US. Uh, uh, a question on identifiers. Uh, you know, did you run into any product identifiers? Uh, you know, issues. I mean, in, in your proof of concept or in your project, uh, where you're using the manufacturer level. Um, UPC or G GS1 standards, just curious to understand the scope within um, uh, consumer goods. Uh, well, uh, because uh, we are talking about uh, uh, the certain, you know, bulk, uh, uh, you know, producers coming from uh, the farms and then they are getting converted into, again, bulk before it reaches uh, to the brands. At brand level, there was manufacturing and they've got a complete... Uh, the serialization programs and multiple things, you know, they've got their own, uh, because it's not the first time they are selling, they are, they are already into a certain ERP system. So they were able right. to feed the data from their existing SAPs so that uh, we did not get uh, any any complications at all. But at the same time, in crypto, we have got certain binding rules. Uh, for example, if you are bringing a, a, a uh, you know, a brand or, 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 or say uh, one particular product, and we will make sure that product uh, ID uh, is, uh, uh, you know, unique. So that is a binding rule I can define. So that way, you know, the, because we want to make sure there is no garbage coming into the system. So that's how we manage, but we do not get into deeper on the domain side of it because they will take that responsibility. They, they took that responsibility to, to feed the data into the system, the the uh, 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 you know making sure the data is uh, not uh, uh, you know compromised or rather the the, the, f the data is not fault. That is checks and balances that we have kept in crypto. 
So what yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think that identification unique, uh, uh, you know, comment that you made. That's I think important because that's what uh, you know the G tens or GS one UPC or uh, global trade item number, whichever name name you are familiar with. That actually is already taking care of the fact that the item is uh, is unique across the industry. So right. So the like a coffee item should not be mixed with the apparel or with the healthcare item. Uh, yeah. So. Okay, thank you. Good. Anybody else out there before we close up? <sighs> Beautiful. Well, Ravi, thank you very much for uh, you and the uh, end of the day prize here. Thanks for calling in from uh, Bangalore and uh, sharing the thoughts, what good work you guys are doing there at Crypt C, uh, supply chain, these two use cases. Uh, we'll look for that document and I'll add it to the wiki there so that that's good. And then I'll stop this recording. I'll be out back out there. Uh, for the folks that are on this or listening uh, uh, on the recording here, we will not have a call two weeks from today, which will be U.S. Thanksgiving. Uh, and then in December, we're going to slide by a week. We're going to have 12-3, uh, so the 3rd of December and 12-17, our next two uh, calls. On the 3rd of December, uh, we have Patrick Duffy from BIDA who is going to share the latest uh, on what's going on with BIDA and the standards work there around shipment and bill lading and various other things. So we're looking forward to that one. So thanks for joining here, either on the recording or live. Again, Ravi and Kripsi, thanks for sharing your uh, use case stories here. And I, I'm not sure I have it, but Ravi, why don't you just say your email fat, real fast here so that uh, folks have that in the future. Sure. Ravi is R-A-V-I at Kripsi.com. It's K-R-Y-P-C, Ravi at Kripsi.com. Beautiful. Okay. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.